from the heart of the Shire. Through the depths of Moria. To the ends of Middle-earth. It's the Babylon Bee. Reads the Lord of the Rings. With your hosts, Kyle Mann and Dan Coates. Chapter 1, A Long-Expected Party When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag End announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 111st birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Thus begins the greatest um, fantasy novel of all time. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you look at opening lines of literature, you think of... Uh, a Tale of Two Cities. It was the best, best of, times. of times. It was the worst, it was the worst of times. Of times. Um, I'm sure I can think of others. But, oh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, he has one of the best ever when it's like uh, there was a boy named Eustace Scrub and he almost deserved it. <laughs> 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 I think that's, um, I don't remember if that's, I don't remember which one that is. I think it's Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I could be wrong. But, uh, yeah. I mean, this this does not feel iconic. It's not super like memorable. It's kind of like, like if very, you asked me ordinary. before we studied for this, what the first line of Lord of the Rings would be, I wouldn't be able have been able to remember. I actually remember the Hobbit one much better. In a hole in the ground, they're living the Hobbit. Yeah. Um, this one is less iconic, but but I think it does everything that an opening line needs to do. Um, 71st birthday. So we were talking in the last episode about these That's quirky. foreign elements, these quirky elements, these yeah. alien things that make you feel like you're in this alien world. Um, the 71st birthday, what the heck is an 111st birthday? Yeah. The party of special magnificence, we've set up this chapter. We now have this event to look forward to. What, what is this party of special magnificence? And then he, he emphasized that with there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Yeah. You've got your setting. You've, You've already got, got your, your person. You got your character. You got your setting. It's quirky, and yet it's mm -hmm. familiar. There, there's going to be a birthday. You know what a birthday party is. Yeah. You don't know what an eleven year first birthday party is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't know what Hobbiton is, but this whole town is now abuzz with this birthday party. Um, I, I guess if you've read The Hobbit, you bring a little extra context into this. You know who Bilbo yeah. Baggins is. Oh, he's old now, you know. He's this old, weird guy that lives in the hill mm -hmm. that a long time ago went away on an adventure and all the town folk are still talking about how weird he is. Yeah. <laughs> he's this weird guy. He's got all his treasure buried up there. Oh, I know it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he talks to Gandalf and Gandalf's uh, just, weird. And I just love towards the end of this chapter, and we'll talk about it more, but all of them thinking that he's got this treasure and trying mm -hmm. to find it in his house. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, great little callback that you don't really have to have read The Hobbit to know about. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the subtle magic of Middle Earth here. We mentioned this in the last episode a bit, but how hobbits just kind of have this quiet magic yeah. about them. They don't cast spells, and yet they have this magic kind of woven into them. Um, Bilbo is 111 years old, yeah, and Frodo and Bilbo have the same birthday. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's almost this theme of fate and the cycle of like this, almost this chosen one in some way. Although I think Tolkien would resist that yeah. specific language. So they have the same birthday. And then as we find out later, Frodo starts out his journey the same day that Bilbo started his mm. journey in The Hobbit. They mm. both leave on their 50th birthday. Mm. Yeah, and there's this connection between the two. So Frodo is Bilbo's favorite nephew, and Frodo's parents died tragically, so Bilbo adopted him. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how Frodo and Bilbo are connected. Yeah, and they're they're kindred spirits. So so Frodo is hanging on Bilbo's every word about his stories and you know yeah. his his tale that he tells, and so they they live together in this hobbit hole uh, at Bag End. And they have the same birthday, so every year they celebrate their birthday together. And then this is like a special birthday. This is uber special mm -hmm. because it's 11D first. He's, he's 111 <laughs> years old. 111, I mean, yeah. Why wouldn't you have a crazy party? Yeah. So there's this theme of um, fate 
in destiny. Yeah. It's also Frodo's 33rd birthday, which, if I'm remembering correctly, isn't that when he's considered an adult? Yeah, I think the, they say the tweens for Hobbit is like between 20 that's and like 33 or something. That's like years for us, yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> like their tween. So he's becoming an, a, a an man, adult. A, an adult yeah. Hobbit, and, and Bilbo's having his 11th first. So it's like a special party, special yeah. significance to that. Frodo is such a millennial man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's quirky and weird. Just this idea that there's this race of little people living somewhere and then their whole 20s, it's just like they're all just carousing and having fun and like they're not responsible adults yet. Whereas in our 20s, yeah, it's, it's like that's that we got to get our life together and figure out how we're going to pay bills and stuff. And well, just, really, but it really yeah. is this like <laughs> that's what we do now. Like kids turn 33 and they're like, well, I guess I better start looking for yeah, a job. I guess, yeah, I guess we're, <laughs> we're all turning into hobbits. We're syncing up with the hobbits now. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I got kicked off my parents' insurance. I guess I better figure life out. <laughs> life expectancy is up. So you might turn 111 someday. Yeah. But yeah, there's this theme of fate, you know. Yeah. That Bilbo and Frodo aren't they weren't out looking for an adventure. You know, they they were going about their lives and uh, Bilbo had this uh longing to see the mountains and longing to go on this adventure to see the elves back in the Hobbit and then again has that here and that's why he bails. But um so there is kind of this internal yeah. longing and like yes, I will go do this, but Externally, there's these forces of fate that are kind of pulling them into these roles that they otherwise wouldn't have wouldn't have uh, been interested in at all. Um, yeah, it seemed like in the Hobbit, by the time <coughs> by the time Gandalf reaches Bilbo in the Hobbit, he's already fifty and he's set in his ways. He's kind of like the uh, the kind of the middle age like, for them. Uh, I'm not. I don't want adventures. You know, we we don't want any adventures here. And then Frodo, he's been listening from Bilbo his whole childhood. So he kind of has that kindling for adventure that Bilbo has given him. Mm. So that's like maybe the, the key difference between them. Yeah. But even then within that fate thing you're talking about that the, they're both related to uh, the, the old Took and they both have that within them that they have this, this, yeah, I found this, that thirst, this, this thirst for adventure that maybe we can bury it. Yeah. You know, with like the, the responsibilities of life and oh, I got all these things I got to mm -hmm. do. It's almost like, you know, when you get older and you stop believing in Santa Claus or whatever, yeah, yeah. there's like this magic and this wonder that's inside us that we can like bury it. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting too. So, yeah. I just want to farm and. Yeah. I got, I got bills I got to pay stuff. and yeah. I got real stuff to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think one of the main things that a long expected party accomplishes is really just describing the Shire. It gives us the oh, depiction yeah. of the Shire. It gives us a place worth fighting for. It gives us a foil to the rest of the um, rest of the story's adventure. Um, uh, <laughs> Tolkien writes in these cycles of rest and action. You know, action, rest, action, rest, action, rest. Um, the kind of, kind of like danger rises. There's a climax. There's a resolution, and then they they find a place of rest. Yeah. Um, so we're starting off, and we start off rest. with the rest. Yeah, um, and for him. I think that gives the action more power. You know, if you if you watch an action movie that's just way over the top and it's like constant, you yeah. just get numb to it. That's what the Hobbit movies did for me. It was just constant, like, what's happening now? Who is this, you know, CGI guy that they're punching? I don't know, you know, because it's just too much. You mean you didn't like that three-hour battle in the last movie of The <laughs> Hobbit where in the extended edition, it's just like battle, battle, well, battle, battle. And in the book, I mean, <clears throat> the Battle of Five Armies is like a page and a half or something. Like yeah. That. <laughs> Bilbo's knocked out. We can for, make a movie out of that. <laughs> Bilbo's knocked out for the entire thing. You know, it, it's... So for Tolkien, it, and I think the movies, the movies communicated this fairly well that you had the sense of, ah... Uh, you know, we're in Rivendell yeah. now, or ah, uh, we're in Lothlorien. Like there's, there's, there's peace and rest. Yeah. And I think that does give the action this. Um, that gives the action more power. That you know, like you know, there may be a rest coming, and like it just gives you this time to breathe. I, I hated Rivendell when I first read the books. I think. Hmm. Like, and I don't know if I hated it, but it, like it's all, it's all long. The, it's thirty the, pages yeah. of them talking. You know? They have the council, and they're talking, yeah. and there a lot of dialogue. Mm -hmm. But I think after having read it as an older man, you know, now it's like. Yeah, you were kind of saying that about the sections of the book, too, where it was like um, 
Oh, they meet some elves. Oh no, the elves are singing. Oh no, <laughs> like you, got, you got to read like a page and a half of singing and you're just like, why is this in here? But then as you get older, you're like, those are like some of your favorite parts. I think you were saying, and I, I agree with that. Yeah. It's like that those places of rest are like where you you hook your your I guess your identity yeah. into your stability. And to this us is home. The type of poetry and song that he wrote maybe don't resonate super well today, but like he's he's saying something about the importance of art and the importance of community and song, you know. Mm. Song has a communal function, I think, in Tolkien, where they're sitting around telling stories and Let's sit by the fire and sing, you know, so whatever the modern day equivalent is, you know, I don't know, watching a TV show or whatever. <laughs> not that that's of the same cultural, that's sad. <laughs> not that that's the same spiritual value. I, I was going value. like the old world, like sitting in an Irish pub and everyone right. like singing the well, same I think, song. I think they objectively all that's and, better. I think objectively yeah. that's spiritually but better. But like nowadays it's like, well, we all watch uh, the mass singer together. Yeah. And, you want to talk about uh, that? Talk I, about I, that at the water cooler, I guess. So. I, I think it's a pale imitation, but I do think you, yeah. there's a modern day analogy in that we, yeah. what is it that is worth fighting for? What is it that is worth defending for us? You know, and maybe it's not Netflix, but that was just a thought. It's not the mass singer. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. will fight for Breaking Bad. I will fight for the Mandalorian. Like I don't know. The Mandalorian, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, That's crazy how countercultural the Mandalorian is. It's, yeah, it's just, just, how did that get made? This, like this gunslinger walking around protecting his baby. <laughs> like what? <laughs> oh man! Super masculine, super toxically masculine. So uh, I mean, I, I guess let's talk a little bit about the Shire then. Um, what? What is the depiction of the Shire in a long expected party? Why do we as the reader now care about the Shire because yeah. of this? Um, we talked a little bit about some of the quirks before in that it's very, um, it's very similar to England in the early 20th century. It's very similar to like maybe rural America today, um, but yet has enough difference where you where you're very interested in this fantastic world. So like they live in these holes. Yeah. It seems like that's the, the, that's the traditional way. I think in the prologue, it says something like that. Most of the hobbits traditionally lived in these hobbit holes. They dig out, mm -hmm. burrow out of the hole and they have circular doors, not rectangular doors. Uh, the doorknobs like right in the middle that that's quirky too. But then it starts saying that they're starting to adopt, um, actual stand up building style too. Um, that's frowned upon. <laughs> or, at least, or at least it's not the the traditional way it seems like so this um, is like a high-rise building being put in your neighborhood yeah someone's putting up the ice or you're like oh man uh, just, just man, dig the hole dig in the a ground. hole like the rest of us <laughs> uh yeah um so there's there's wacky people there's the sackville bagginses that bilbo's always kind of at odds with um they're 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 around and they're and, and bilbo's annoyed by his relatives you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just fantastic. Uh, there's all these little things that you can just so relate to. Um, I'm trying to pull up my notes from my um, that I made in my Kindle version. Um, you have characters like Sam uh, living at the bottom of the hill. He's the gardener. Him and his uh, the old gaffer. They they kind of live adjacent to Bilbo and they take care of Bilbo's property. Yeah. So you get introduced to Sam and uh, the the old gaffer. Uh, you have you have these scenes where like uh, they're they're all hanging out at the at the pub and they're they're drinking and telling stories and they're all trying to figure out what what where all where all Bilbo's treasure is. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I guess you know yeah there there's actually less world building in here than I remember and that a lot of that is done in the prologue. A lot of it's in the prologue because it is very quick in this book when Gandalf shows up and this is really yeah. our instigating event. This is our catalyst. This kicks off the rest of the adventures of the book. Um, Gandalf shows up with fireworks, and this is another cool quirk <laughs> of of the Shire: is that the most exciting thing that happens to them in decades is like this yeah. old man shows up with fireworks. Like, yeah. how wonderful is that? We're so like desensitized to fun and exciting things. I don't know if you ever like show your kids fireworks. My kids love them. Um, I'm trying to think of more things that I would show them. It's like, this is amazing. And it's like, eh, well, we got video yeah. games. So, you know, it's just, <clears throat> I know we just sound like a couple of old guys ranting now, but 
Well, but I see that same characteristic yeah. in myself where I'm less impressed by things that should impress me and like give when me a you, sense of wonder. Like when you were a kid, when they set up the Christmas tree or put up the, the lights mm -hmm. on the house, mm -hmm. that was just like a, a marvelous, wonderful... Yeah. There's something special and magical about this. You, you know, whatever your background is, if you had that, that experience of like seeing all the lights go up in town, you kind of have that sense of wonder and like, well, mm -hmm. what's going on? What is this? Uh, so I think fireworks were like that. Christmas lights were like that for me. Um, I've got my two year old now. We set up the Christmas tree. And <laughs> what did she say to she? Had, well, first she's tried to get like the Christmas tree a hug. <laughs> <laughs> but like but another part of it she's like this christmas tree makes me happy and oh like, man oh and we just got like a little pipe cleaner you know branches looking the four foot you know <laughs> charlie brown it's little charlie brown it's leaning yeah. over the star you know it's off off center you know but she's like this tree makes me happy and i'm like oh yeah, that's great i wish i could be like that about, about life everything generally about everything yeah something very chestertonian about that um yeah. Oh, the other thing uh, that's that was unique about the Shire that they talk about here is that they give presents on their birthday. Yeah. Instead of get presents, and that's yeah. another fun thing that just Tolkien just takes these ordinary things and adds that sense of wonder to them that just makes you look at them in a new way. So you're constantly getting gifts if you live in the Shire. Yeah. Because you're always I mean, once a week you probably have a friend that has a birthday party and you get a gift. Um, I wonder if there was a grouch. It was like, he's regifting. That's yeah. a regift. <laughs> I thought he said something about that in here, like things that get passed around. Did he say something? There, about, there was something about the Matham the Mathams? house where like if things get passed around so much and like people just like don't even really know what they're used for. Yeah. Or it's just like, wow, well, well, I don't I don't have a use for this. Let's put it in the basically the museum of things they can't figure out what the use is of it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Gandalf shows up, he's got fireworks. Yeah. They have the elf rune G on them, which what do you is know? tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> I don't know if we can. It's, uh, it's like upside down, so you'll have to get that. But that's the uh, that's the G rune. Now, I got this tattoo, and nobody has ever recognized that's it. Your so. street, that's your street cred right there. So, But that's what I wanted. I, you know, if you, did, you, you could get something, like, obvious. Like, oh, I know what that is. That's yeah. whatever, the one ring or whatever. But You didn't put, like, the not all who <coughs> wander or lost on your back I'm or thinking something. about <laughs> it. I have a couple of Lord of the Rings tattoo ideas. Um, me and my wife are going to get matching <laughs> where she gets not all who wander. Or, uh, I'm going to get all that is gold does not glitter, and she'll get not all who wander or lost. Mm. Um, I want to get the I want to get some of Sam's song possibly when he's in uh, when he's in Mordor, where hmm. he says, um, "Is that where he's looking up at the stars?" Yeah, uh, yeah, part of that. Yeah, and then he says, um, uh, uh, "I will not say the day is done nor bid the stars farewell." Oh mm. my gosh, man! <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get there. But yeah, uh, you just have like these life mottos that come from Lord of the Rings. Yeah. It's just like if I could just remember this lesson behind these words yeah just yeah or I, I scroll up a bit to the previous episode notes i think i have that amazing quote from uh from uh return of the king oh we're 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 sam sees the light peek out from the clouds when they're in yeah. mordor and he's depressed it says <clears throat> and he realizes that um there was light and high beauty forever beyond the reach of the shadow and that yeah. to me is just like Oh man! <laughs> so good, good is eternal, and that evil can only try to twist or corrupt, and that evil is fading. Evil is temporary and fading and yeah. fleeting, and it's not. It can it, never. It can never overtake the star. There's a great Spurgeon sermon where he talks about like if all the combined forces of man were to attack God's throne, it would be like ants running into like a, the throne of a king or something. Like, <laughs> like he's just like, what are you doing? Like. Yeah. And, and to me, that's like the the, the shadows just like yeah. doing all this stuff. And there's this eternity out there. Um, uh, not to get too far off track, but that's like that Lewis quote where like if you're a madman and you're scribbling in your cell. Um, oh, yeah. I remember uh, that. Like you can't, he can't ever block he out the sun. Yeah, he thinks he's going to blot out the sun. But he's just it. writing the word darkness over and yeah. over and over. And so you can't ever, you can't ever make things dark. Yeah. You know? So I probably butchered that. But oh, no, yeah, no, that's all right. So, okay, we're in the Shire, and we got something to fight for. Gandalf shows up, and he's got these fireworks. We're kind of talking about the wonder, yeah, the of, wonder of fireworks uh, just and, simple, and pleasures. simple pleasures. 
I love the hobbits. I just got to say it again yeah. that they're just simple people, simple food. We will implore you all throughout uh, this series be like the be, hobbits. Be the hobbits. Be the hobbits. Yeah. You know, if we were all hobbits, life would be life so much would be better. better. I mean, then they have this birthday party, and that's the highlight of their like. Yeah. Like this crazy old rich guy is having a party. <laughs> like, let's go to this. Yeah. And that's just fantastic. Um, I love the I love the humor. We we haven't talked much about this yet, but Tolkien has a great dry British sense of humor. And throughout the, I highlighted all these passages where the hobbits are just so excited about food. And it's just, <laughs> so they're all, we'll, we'll get to the event where he, uh, he puts the ring on and disappears, but they're all. Flower bed. Can I say, they're all, tick, we're going to, this will be our first flower bed. They're all ticked <laughs> off about Bilbo disappearing. Like, that's very rude and blah, blah, blah. And then they're like. We're going to need some more food. We're going to need some more food and wine to make up for that. <laughs> that just yeah. makes me so happy. Um, I love the proud foots, proud feet. Mm -hmm. They have this rich tradition of being called the proud feet, and he's very upset that they call he called them the and proud I, foot. I, I think the way Tolkien phrases it, he says with his feet up on the table. Yeah. So it's like there's all these. I think know, Jackson did that in the movie yeah. too. There was the feet up, <laughs> and then he stamps his feet when when Bilbo disappears. He like pounds his huge feet <laughs> on the ground. Uh, there's the classic line: "I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve." <laughs> I still haven't quite worked that classic. one out. It's a compliment. Is it? Yeah. I thought he was trashing them. No, he says, "Go okay, because the first part of the quote, right? I would like, okay, so I don't know half of you. So I don't know half of you. Half okay. as well as I should like. Half so I really well. want to like you guys. I, I want to know you I want to know you, but I yeah. don't know, I only don't know half of you half as well as I want to. Sure. And I like less than half of you. Okay. So a small number of you that I like. Half as well as you deserve. Half so there's only a few of you that deserve. I appreciate the way you should be appreciated. Yeah. So I think it's kind of a backhanded combo where he's saying, I don't like very many yeah. of you, but you really deserve better than that. But then the crowd doesn't receive it as a yeah. compliment. They're like, what? Eh? <laughs> but it's funny because he's got this, like, he's got the crowd eating out of the palm of his hand. He's like, to health, to life, yeah. to whatever. And they're like, yeah, okay, beer, more beer. And then he just says this, like, random, and they're like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> I just love how quirky Bilbo is that he yeah. doesn't care. Yeah, Bilbo kind of embodies that, like, I am who I am, and, uh, yeah, he's just confident in himself. He's not trying to be a crowd pleaser. He's just like, ah, yeah. I'm going to invite the whole town, and I'm going to cheese them off. Like, <laughs> I'm going to mess with them. Yeah. And then he says, uh, together we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this total. One gross, if I'm using <laughs> may use the expression. No cheers. Yeah. So the whole so crowd be is like being calling, called gross. Yeah, it's like calling, like, you guys are like a 48-pack of beer. <laughs> this is great. I picked you guys so you would be like a dozen eggs. Yeah. And, and, and it's, they're all upset with him. Um, so it's like, I was only invited to, to fill your number of your stupid joke. Like, <laughs> and that's basically all he yeah. was doing. One gross indeed. Vulgar expression. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then we have get, we have Bubba putting on the ring, and I again yeah. love this about hobbits that he's got this basically nuclear super weapon. Yeah, and he uses it to tell a practical joke, like to just pull off a practical <laughs> joke on everybody. To just mess with everybody. I'm just gonna screw with you guys yeah. with this like nuke I have in my pocket. Like I have the most powerful thing in Middle Earth, and yeah. I'm just gonna mess with you guys. It was yeah. generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste and more food and drink were needed to cure the <laughs> guests of shock and annoyance. Part of this, too, that I really like right before that, uh, if I'm not uh, backing up no, too no, much. No, yeah, fine. But, like, nobody wants to hear this big, long story from him, and Bilbo still tells the story. He's like, this is also the anniversary when I arrived by barrel at Esgaroth on the Long Lake, and the fact that it was my birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem important. The bank was very splendid, however, and I had a bad cold at the time, and blah, blah, you know. So he's going blah, <laughs> he's just on and on and on, and everyone's just sitting there like, when's this guy going to shut up? Like, so I just love that part oh, about, man. I love that part about Bilbo, that he's just like, uh, he's very Treg-like, if I might say. Like, uh, when the audience doesn't know Treg, but our yeah. friend Treg, <laughs> that reminds me of him quite a bit. Just telling the long story. On he's him. like, I'm just going to be who I am, and you're gonna, either going to like it or not like it, and I'm, I'm still going to tell my story. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Treg, if you're watching this, we love you. Um, uh, Rory, Brandy, Rory Brandybuck is upset. 
<laughs> and he says, uh, silly old fool, Bilbo, but why worry? He hasn't taken the vittles with him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh, there's all his food here. Yeah, yeah. he's still got food, This I is guess. all good. Um, the Sackville Bagginses depart in wrath. So I, I kind of mentioned the Sackville Bagginses, yeah. but what, what was the deal with them that when he left on his journey, didn't he accuse them of like walking off with some spoons when he came back and his house was like um, being sold off or... Did that happen in The Hobbit? I think it happened okay. in The Hobbit where... Yeah, he, I know he mentions it here. I didn't realize it was a callback to The Hobbit. Because he, he's gone for like a year on his journey. When he comes back, they're selling off all his stuff. And he has right. to like run in there. No, no, no. The I'm, auctioneer is like yeah. at his house like... Yeah, yeah banging yeah, the gavel, yeah. getting rid of all his stuff. <laughs> and I think in that it's, it's at that moment that one of the Sackville Baggins is walks off with some of his spoons. Yeah. And so for like the last... How many years is it? For like 51 to 111... For like 60 years, he's been stewing that the Sackville Baggins just have his spoons. <laughs> <laughs> That's just fantastic. Yeah. And again, you see these little local concerns of ordinary people. Like he's much more concerned about his spoons than he has this <laughs> ring. Yeah. That contains like the soul or power essence of the Dark Lord Sauron, you know. Yeah. Uh, he's much more concerned about the spoons, of course. Can we do like a quick uh, rundown of the gifts that he gives? After yeah, so so let's, so let's summarize. Um, so we have we have the Shire, just this little green patch, uh, quaint little place. I don't know if we want to throw the map up of Middle Earth, but it's up in the north uh, west of Middle Earth, and <coughs> this is kind of it's kind of been untouched by the outside world, whether that's because of some subtle magic of hobbits or whatever. And um, but these uh, the events from the outside of the Shire are starting to encroach yeah. on the Shire. So in the Hobbit, uh, if you don't, if you never read the Hobbit or whatever, Bilbo had found the One Ring of Power, which belonged to Sauron, the Dark Lord. He kind of poured his soul, his malevolence, his essence into it, and it was cut off uh, his finger by this sword. Yeah, right here. If you're on video. Well, the, the other version of the sword. The Shards of Narsil. Oh, I knocked something over. Yes. By, by Narsil, this is the reforged version, Andural. But, um, and so this ring passed out of time and mind for thousands of years. And by chance, or by fate, I would say, Bilbo found this ring in The Hobbit through those events. And he's brought it back, and it's just been sitting in his house. So he's got, like, the thing that can he's bring got, back yeah. the Dark Lord, and it's just sitting in his chest or whatever just hanging out in his pocket in his pocket he's got it on him he plays with it from time to time yeah. he tells he, he uses it for practical jokes so they throw this birthday party bilbo says i'm never seeing you guys again throws the ring on disappears gandalf hurriedly like creates a flash of light to make it seem like it was just a trick that he did or something and then bilbo starts putting his things in order to leave so bilbo actually leaves there's a little struggle with bilbo and gandalf where Gandalf wants uh, wants him to leave the ring, and Bilbo keeps wanting to take the ring, and finally he agrees, I'll leave the ring. Gandalf has started to suspect at this point that um, that this ring may be one of the rings of power. I don't know how much he knows at this point. This was the one thing I was always a little unclear on. Um, but Gandalf it seems has, like he had suspicions. He knows it's a ring of power. He knows it's a ring of power, and he knows that it's made Bilbo lie in the past. Mm -hmm. So he knows there's something bad about this yeah. ring. Because he, I think that might be in the foreword or the prologue too on the finding of the ring. Yeah. Where it's kind of, I think in the first edition of The Hobbit, the story of how he gets the ring from Golem is a little bit different than the final version. And yeah. how they how they kind of rework that in here is like, oh, well, Bilbo originally kind of fibbed about it. And so he knows that there's something off yeah. about him having this ring. And to kind of set to world build a little bit for <clears> you guys, if you've never read Lord of the Rings before, um, it's not a world. It's not like a Dungeons and Dragons world where there's a there's a magic ring at every shopkeep in every village where you can just buy magic crap. You yeah, know? I'm gonna go to the magic salesman. It's like to get a mag a ring of power is very rare. Yeah. So Gandalf is like very concerned. Like, how the heck did this show up here? And I think Gandalf kind of have who's who's on the level of an archangel really um, has his pull has his finger on the pulse of like the strings of fate that are being woven or whatever. I'm mixing my metaphors here, but, <laughs> but he, he knows like, it's very strange that this ordinary guy in this little, who cares about it? Shire has found the ring of power. Yeah. And so he's starting to suspect there are, there's something bigger going on here that in, in the, in the wheel of fate or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's so something kind of cool about Gandalf being this arch wizard 
mm-hmm. or, or this arch like angel. And he's just like puttering through the Shire with a bunch of fireworks. Yeah. And I, I think, think <laughs> I think he knows what's important. Like, yeah, this is what's important. Like he comes to earth and he's like, he comes to middle earth and he's like fireworks and beer and pipe tobacco. Like, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, there's good things in the world. And even the, um, even I guess Gandalf realizes it before we get to the gifts. We've got the, the important scene where Gandalf refuses the ring from Bilbo. I think that's significant. Um, uh, Bilbo says, I will not give you the ring. And he says, then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. And he seems to grow and the shadow fills the room. And he's like, they Peter, did a pretty good yeah. job in the movie. Peter Jackson yeah. did an excellent mm-hmm. job on that scene. Yeah, for sure. And it says, then he seemed to dwindle again to a gray old man, bent and troubled. Um, we see the effect of the ring on Bilbo, which is going to be a big theme through the books. But Bilbo is very troubled to give this thing up. But once he gives it away, this burden passes. Like... He's 111 and he hasn't really aged since he got the ring. So everyone's yep. like, dude, that guy's freaking weird. Why, why does he still look like he's 50? Like, you know, yeah, it's preserved him. It's, uh, he looks well preserved. I think is what the, yeah, what Tolkien thin says. Thin and stretched like butter scraped over too much bread. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, the song, you know, we have to mention the song, the road goes ever on and on down from the door where it began. Now far ahead, the road has gone and I must follow if I can. Mm. pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet and whither then I cannot say. I think a key theme for the book, uh, these roads and, and, and paths and fate and this journey. Um, he's starting a new journey at that point. <coughs> he yeah. said goodbye to the ring and he's laid aside that burden mm. and now he's got a new life. Um, yeah. The hobbits get up in the morning. There's a bunch, a bunch of them are hung over. It says, <laughs> it says people came to clean everything up, and it says the, the bags and gloves and handkerchiefs and the uneaten food, a very small item. <laughs> yeah, there's not much food left. <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's get to the gifts. This is I'm going to talk about the the humor of Tolkien a bit, and we need to break to subscribers soon. But the humor of hmm. Tolkien, this is great. So Gandalf, um, or so sorry, Bilbo has left gifts like an inheritance kind of yeah for people as he has uh, basically uh bilbo decides to go he's gonna go live with the elves in rivendell that's like his retirement forget this i'm out he was a shire he's going to rivendell um and he leaves behind gifts for the various Mm -hmm. relatives and such yeah we both we both really appreciated this humor of tolkien uh (laughs) so like so keeping with hobbit tradition on your birthday you give gifts to other people not you don't get gifts so he's got like for Adelard took for his very own in, in all caps from Bilbo on an umbrella. Adelard had carried off many unlabeled ones. <laughs> I love so. like what a freaking jackass Bilbo is. <laughs> <laughs> this little guy's like keeps stealing his umbrellas and he's yeah. like a gift for you. Here's an umbrella. <laughs> umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Here's for Dora Baggins in memory of a long all caps long correspondence. With love from Bilbo on a large waste pa- <laughs> waste paper basket, Dora was Drogo's sister, uh, which is, I think is Bilbo's dad. Yeah, if I'm remembering it right, he's the eldest surviving female relative of Bilbo and Frodo. She was 99 and had written reams of good advice for more than half a century. So, so he's like, he, "Here's where all your advice went." <laughs> so he gives her the very <laughs> trash can that he had thrown all of her letters. A memory of a long correspondence. Uh, for Milo Burroughs, hoping it will be useful from BB on a gold pen and ink bottle. Milo never answered letters. <laughs> He's like, this guy must not have a pen. Here, here's a pen, buddy. You know, <laughs> this is like the very passive aggressive gifts, like from your mom or grandma yeah. or something. You know, <laughs> since you never respond to text yeah. messages, yeah. here's a new iPhone. Yeah. You know, or something. Or like for your wife, you're like, hey, you need to. You need to get in shape. Here's an exercise bike. Yeah, it's giving like, someone an exercise <laughs> machine. That's what it is. That's what it is, really. Yeah. Here's and a the, gym membership. Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> the best one is the Lobelia. Is it Lobelia? Oh, yeah. That's the very end. Sackville Baggins? Yeah. So there's, there's two more and then Lobelia. But Lobelia Sackville Baggins as a present in all caps on a case of silver spoons. Bilbo believed that she had acquired a good many of his spoons while he was away on his former journey. Lobelia knew that quite well. When she arrived later in the day, she took the point at once. 
but she also took the spoons. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she she's offended but she's like well these are good spoons i'm still i'm still taking these oh that's fantastic that's so good all right well we're going to go to our subscriber portion and we're going to kind of finish out the chapter we've covered all the main important points for you freeloaders so don't worry about that too much <laughs> uh but we're going to get to um some of the foreshadowing elements where uh tolkien has kind of planted the seed of like there's something else going on here this isn't just all fun and game so yeah. let's get to that for next week, read uh, chapter two, which is uh, Shadows, Shadows of, the past. of the Past, I think. And I believe this is one of the first chapters that Tolkien wrote, if I remember right. Yeah, I think in the foreword, he, he says that that was one of the most, or that was one of the original ones that he wrote yeah. down long ago before before the writing of the story. Yeah. It's just a great, great scene. So yeah, we're going to get there. everything in the context. Next week, so follow along, read uh, Shadows of the Past for next week. So do we have mailbag in the subscriber portion? Uh, we can go through some more of the comments. Yeah. I think Patrick had pulled most of yeah, them. So but keep sending your comments and, and questions to our email. Mm -hmm. uh, are we doing the podcast email? The podcast at babylonb.com. Podcast at babylonb.com. And also on the premium post, when we post that, comment, qu ask your question. We, we want you guys to be part of this. Your thoughts, show. your things that jump out at you. Yeah. This is like uh, piping in at Bible study. So, piping in at Bible study. Um, this is what Ephesians four twelve means to me. No, no. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Don't be that guy. But you know, just send us your questions. I mean, here we go. Subscriber portion. See you later, freeloaders. Talk See to you guys. next week. Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the closing line. Um, and this sense of um, this kind of ominous foreshadowing at the end of the chapter, which I think is brilliant that Tolkien does here. Yeah, We basically started this podcast just to just get the swords. To justify the sword buying. Yeah. But I think it's primarily because of the movies. And I'm wondering how ubiquitous Lord of the Rings would be without the films. You, know. you were asking a question you already knew the answer to. No, I... I <laughs> you set it. me up and I didn't knock it down and you're like, I'll do it. I'll just answer it. <laughs> Kyle and Dan would like to thank Seth and Dan Dillon for buying us cool swords and paying the bills. Adam Ford for creating our jobs. Ethan Nicole for creative direction. And all the writers at the Babylon Bee. Matthew McDavid for guiding studio operations. Patrick Green for show production. Kathleen Petty for laugh tracks. The Babylon Bee subscribers who make what we do possible. And you, the listener. Until next time, this is Austin Robertson, the voice of the Babylon Bee, reads The Lord of the Rings, reminding you, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. To watch or listen to the rest of this show, become a Babylon Bee subscriber at babylonb.com slash plans.